Now, we are living in momentous times. You wouldn't know it if you were listening to the rest of the media because the biggest stories are either completely ignored or they are spun in a way with an agenda that is the opposite of fostering understanding. We're talking double standards here, dear listeners, on an epic, an Everestian scale. We're talking about cynicism of the deepest, deepest Alice in Wonderland, deepest rabbit hole kind. Let me just give you some examples. France has withdrawn its ambassador to Italy for consultations in a hail of protests about Italy interfering in France's internal domestic affairs. That's France, led by President Macron, who incidentally has the support currently of 16% of all French men and women. Macron is leading the EU challenge to the sovereignty of Venezuela and its right to elect its own president. So it's okay for France to ceaselessly interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, and now Venezuela, but it is completely unacceptable for its neighbour, Italy, to have a point of view about the bludgeoning down, the tear gassing, the truncheoning in, and the live fire being used by the security forces in France against the hundreds of thousands of people on the streets demonstrating against the policies and the governance of President Macron. Now, you may know nothing about any of this. You may never have heard of the yellow vests. You may not know that this week the biggest trade union in France, the mighty CGT, joined the yellow vests in a general strike in our nearest neighbour, 29 miles off the coast of England. There is a revolution going on and you know nothing about it unless you follow me and one or two other choice outlets for political news and information. That's not an accident. You are being deliberately deprived of that information just in case it becomes catching, because, hey, we don't have enough yellow vests to supply demonstrators in Britain were it to catch on. Once that stockpile has been built up, there will then be a market, and maybe you'll get to hear about it. But you probably don't know that two European Union members, giant, important European Union members, are tonight almost in a state of diplomatic war, ambassadors being recalled, missives, pronunciamento from Paris and Rome flying across the Alps. Well, this European Union ain't working out quite so smoothly. I mentioned that as a segue, of course, into uh, Cardinal Donald Tusk. I call him Cardinal because he seems to know who's going to heaven, and who's going to hell. And I'm one of those he presumably has consigned to the hottest place in hell. I wonder where he got that phrase, by the way. I wonder which language school he got that phrase from. Or was it supplied to him by one of the British fifth column, never out of his office? According to Cardinal Tusk, we Brexiteers are destined for a very hot part of hell for having the temerity of deciding by a democratic vote to leave the trading bloc which he controls. Now, I disagree with Theresa May on 99.9% .9 of all issues. But as I've said here before, the idea that you can conduct negotiations with an important sovereign state and 
contributing member for 40 years to the European Union in the way that Tusk and Barney and, uh, and Junkers et al. have been doing is not just bad politics. It is a grave national insult. Anyway, Theresa May went back there with her latest model of Brexit and we'll see how it has fared. I go out on a limb on these matters, as you know, so it's my view that all this smoke, all this heat is merely a cover for the fact that we're actually getting closer to a deal. A deal that will not be that far away from the deal that has been proselytised by the much derided Jeremy Corbyn for the last two and a half years. You remember all these correspondents who told us that Corbyn had no Brexit plan? Well, of course, he's always had a Brexit plan. Whether I agree with it or not is another matter. But his Brexit plan is much more likely to bring about a satisfactory end to these negotiations than any other plan on the table. And that's why something like it may very well unite the House of Commons in time for the 29th of March, or else we leave with no deal. And as I've said to you many times, that would not be a walk in the park, but it wouldn't be the end of the world either. All I'm going to say on that is to paraphrase uh, Groucho Marx. I would not want to belong to a club that was run by Donald Tusk, Michel Barnier, or Herr Junkers. And every day that has passed since we voted to leave their club confirms, in my view, that we did the right thing. And then there's the Irish question. Well, I'm so old, I remember when Irish nationalists, Irish republicans were against the EU and all its works. I was interested to see a speech given in 2009 by Jeremy Corbyn in Ireland on the occasion of the EU forcing Ireland to vote for a second time on the Lisbon Treaty, a treaty to which now many Labour members seem to be umbilically connected. But Labour was against the Lisbon Treaty. Jeremy Corbyn and me, under the leadership of Mr Ben, stayed up all night, many nights, trying to wreck the Tories' successful attempt to wed us to the Lisbon Treaty without a referendum. Ireland got a referendum and then another one. We didn't get one at all, and we should have. We had been promised that we would have. Now, one of the unforeseen consequences, unforeseen except here on the mother of all talk shows, is that Brexit is now acting as a driver for the reunification of the small island of Ireland. Sing hallelujah. That division, partition, that border should never have been there in the first place. And if one of the consequences, which I foreseen, prophesied, proselytized for, of Brexit is to bring about the historic reunification of Ireland, well, that's a very, very good thing, so far as I am concerned. Now, Sinn Féin, the biggest party in Ireland, North and South, has said that if there is a no-deal Brexit, there will be a border poll, as provided for in the Good Friday Agreement, where the people of Ireland, North and South, will be able to vote on whether to reunify their country. I hope they do. Now I finish on Jeremy Corbyn. And this is where I really mean we've disappeared down the rabbit hole. I saw a statement by Dame Margaret Hodge earlier today that constituency Labour parties tabling motions of no confidence in their MPs was a vindictive absurdity. Just two years ago, the very same Margaret Hodge tabled a motion of no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn, setting in process 
a series of events that culminated in a meeting of the Parliamentary Labour Party that was designed to, according to people who were there and widely reported at the time, break him as a man, break him as a man. So my question's really quite simple. Why is it OK for these Blairite Labour MPs to table a motion of no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn, but it's not OK for their own members to table motions of no confidence in them, the MPs, who themselves tabled such a motion against Jeremy Corbyn. Now, hypocrisy is the middle name of most politicians, but what about the journalists? What about the so-called journalists that are reporting this without even the historic memory of two years? Did it occur to none of them that there's a hypocrisy involved here? Now, I just mentioned, for those listening from the regulator, as talk radio and every radio has spent the entire day heaping ordure on Jeremy Corbyn, is it OK if I, for a few minutes, stick up for him? You know, in the interests of balance. Now the man who knows what's happening in the corridors of power is Andrew Woodcock, the political editor at the Press Association. I'm glad to say Andrew joins us now. Andrew, welcome back. Good evening, George. Summarise for us, Andrew, if you will, uh, where things lie. What's the timetable now? And then we'll go on to what the likely outcomes might be. Well, right now we're in the middle of a gigantic game of chicken, really. We're, we're looking ahead to March the 29th, which is the deadline for um, the UK to leave the European Union unless unless an extension is requested. Um no one or virtually no one on either side is actively seeking a no-deal scenario, but equally no one on either side wants to give anything up at this stage. So we're now looking at talks next week, um, which are, you know, Theresa May is hoping will produce some sort of a withdrawal agreement which the House of Commons can accept. She's given herself a deadline of next Wednesday to achieve that. I don't think there's anyone in Westminster or in Brussels who believes she has a hope of, uh, of um, getting any sort of new deal by next Wednesday. So she'll then come forward to the, the, the House of Commons. She'll make a statement on, on the progress that's been achieved so far, and she'll lay what's called a neutral motion, which unusually will be um, a motion which, the, which MPs will be able to amend. So the following day, we'll have a whole raft of amendments put down yeah, some some people will will you know there'll, there'll doubtless be amendments saying to get rid of the backstop. There'll be amendments to say let's have a. Um, but these are merely indicative uh, votes, aren't they, Andrew? They don't actually they tie the government's hand. No, they're, they're not binding on the government. There was there was an attempt last week to to make one of them binding on the government by actually in, instead of, um, of of requesting um, a or. or uh, voting for an extension of Article 50, the MPs would have voted to set aside a day on which they could pass a bill which would extend Article 50, and that would have been binding. That, that one fell by that, I think, it was 23 votes. Yep. There's probably going to be a replay of that on, on, on Thursday next week. But as you say, most of them are, are not going to be binding on the government. It's quite possible we'll get exactly the same results that we had last Tuesday. And then we're into the end game then with, um, with Theresa May having to find some sort of a deal before March the 29th, um, and you know, neither side looking like they're, they're ready to budge. Um, you know, the, the EU are very, very firm. They're not going to reopen the withdrawal agreement. The, you know, on the, 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 the right of the Tory party, the European Research Group and the DUP who prop up the Tories are very firm that they're not, they, they, they want to, won't accept anything short of a change to the withdrawal agreement and legally binding assurances that the backstop will be taken out or will be changed out of all recognition. Um, so it, it's it's going to be a matter of who blinks first, I think, as mm. we get closer and closer to the, 20, to the 29th. You can call the whole thing off because you say tomato and I so say tomato, but it's not sensible uh, to do so. Um, if you uh, 
change the name of the backstop to the front stop or the side stop or any other uh, name, if you uh, find a form of words which essentially means much the same thing but doesn't have the red flags attached to it, it is perfectly possible that we can, at the last hour, reach that deal. I'll tell you why I say that, Andrew, because in the financial pages today, I discover that the looming collapse of finance capitalism has quietly uh, been averted, uh, that we are going to continue after a no-deal Brexit, after the 29th of March, trading uh, derivatives and commodities and all across the international uh, financial highways, just in the way we are now. In, in, in a sense, good business sense will determine that some kind of deal is reached, don't you think? I think that's, that is precisely what Theresa May's calculation is. She thinks that when it comes down to it, the people um, who are looking for Brexit want there to be a deal virtually all of them. There's a handful in the Tory party who are actively looking for there not to be a deal, but most of them do want a deal of some sort or another. And as you say, um, what, what she needs to offer them is a ladder to climb down because a lot of them have got out there on the barricade, they've said no to the backstop, they said this backstop is the worst deal that could possibly be imagined, this would make us into vassals. And they can't say to their supporters, oh, I was wrong about that turns out it's all right, they need to be given an opportunity to say, oh, this is something entirely different, so give the backstop a different name. And they'll say, oh, yes, that's something we can accept. And what Theresa May is, is hoping is that at the last moment, that's what they'll do. Mm. Um, now, tell, tell me this, Andrew. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, much derided for not having a, a, um, a, a Brexit plan, uh, just sitting it out, waiting for his enemy to make uh, mistakes. Turns out that his long proselytised uh, Brexit plan seems to cut more mustard in Brussels than Mrs May's. Yeah, it got a warm reception from certainly from Donald Tusk. He, he apparently told us today it was an interesting, um, interesting plan that uh, was worth, worth a look. Um, Leo Varadkar said something very similar today. The um, Prime Minister of Ireland, whether they are to an extent trolling the Prime Minister by by saying these things, whether whether they seriously believe um, in the plan um, as as Mr. Corbyn put it out, because I mean there, there are elements in there that would be very difficult for the EU to accept, but. Um, I think I think that they they are quite attracted by the idea of something that would um, gain support not from just one side of the of, of Parliament because they're very worried that Mrs May may get her plan over the line. She may scrape through by a, a vote or two, but it's not a stable um, majority in that case. And they still they're looking ahead to years of um, negotiations over the. Um, the future relationship, they don't want to be negotiating with a with um, a government which you know, that got the very basics, which is what's in the withdrawal agreement, um, has uh, is you know only passed by by the, the narrowest of fingertips. So they're looking at that. And there's a lot of the European governments, of course, are coalitions. They're very a lot of the countries have very different political traditions from us, and they, the left wing and the right wing party join in a grand coalition and they cooperate with one another. And I think in Brussels, they're looking at it and they're thinking, if only the British were like that, if only Labour and Tories could sit down together, you could probably get Corbyn's deal through Parliament with, you know, 50, 100 vote majority possibly. Well, I think that's right. Uh, if, if he put forward his Brexit plan, uh, then a significant number of Conservatives could, but for tribalism, vote for it. It, it could actually get two-thirds uh, of the votes in Parliament. But lastly... I mean, the, the problem there with what you're saying is if he put it forward, he could get this. I think if it was put forward by someone else and the you know, I think the fact that it's put forward by Jeremy Cor Cor Corbyn makes it automatically toxic to virtually all Tory MPs. Mm. And it's quite, that, yeah, that's, it's that's, why, that's what I mean by, by tribalism. Now, finally, Andrew, little notice so far, because it's only, I think, just breaking. Uh, the, the Nigel Farage new vehicle, the Brexit Party, has been registered today by the Electoral Commission. He's going to lead it up. If there is any delay, he's going to lead it into the uh, U European Parliament elections. Is this uh, significant? Could this fly? Well, when you consider that UKIP under Nigel Farage's leadership won the last European elections, then, I mean, one, one of my colleagues was talking to Mr Farage earlier on this, this, this evening when, um, when we got news through of the Electoral Commission um, registration. And 
you know, Farage was, was quite openly saying, yes, I'll, I'll lead this party into the European elections and my aim will be to win it again. And I, there's certainly there's a lot of people out there who voted leave and they look at what's happened over the last two or three years and their principal thought is not doubt about whether we should leave or not. It's doubt about the people who are running the process of arranging the, the, the Brexit. They, they don't think that the government has done it well. They think it's a simple message. We want to leave. Let's get out there. Let's do it quickly. And Nigel Farage is, is great at articulating that message. It, it's certain that he would have a major impact. And a lot of people are thinking, why are we even electing MEPs now when we're, we're on our way out? But um, if, if, as you say, if it's extended beyond, um, beyond uh, the end of May, I think it is, then mm. um, I think the, the rules of the EU will be that we would have to... Um, put we'd, ha- we'd, we'd, have, we'd have seats that had to be yeah. filled. I did say lastly, but if you'll forgive me, Andrew, um, just in case we can't get Vince Cable on... He said uh, in the Metro today, he's not doing interviews otherwise, uh, that uh, 25 Labour and Conservative MPs are poised, that awful word, I don't know how you can poise for quite so long, uh, poised to join him in a new uh, cross-party parliamentary grouping. Any intel on that? Well, there have been Labour MPs, certainly, who have been making noises. Um, Owen Smith, you might have heard, you know, he challenged Jeremy Corbyn for the leadership only a couple of years ago. He, he was, his response to Jeremy Corbyn's plan was, if that's what we're doing, then I have to consider, and I think other people would have to consider their position or that their responsibilities, I think maybe was the word he used. He's not openly saying, you know, making a, a threat to leave, but he's hinting that it's something that's, that's crossing people's minds. I mean, the, the, the chatter around Westminster is, I don't know, about 25, I think, is ambitious for, for Vince Cable. But, you know, there's, there's, I don't know, eight or ten Tories maybe who would find it very difficult to, to remain in a party which is going for no deal. There's probably the same number of, of Labour MPs who, who find it um, unpalatable to, to be in a party which is actually advocating Brexit. They, they've held on to this this uh, glimmer of an idea that the party will eventually, or the leadership of the party will eventually fall in behind a second referendum, and that seems to be getting more and more distant. I don't know, maybe, maybe Vince is right, maybe 25 is plausible. I mean, I think all MPs look to the experience of the SDP and they think no matter how much of, how much of a splash you make when you first um, you know, go out on your own and you form a new party, um, it's very, very difficult to maintain that in the um, British political system, and I think a lot of them are are very, very wary of that. But we are coming to crunch point now, and if there's if anyone's going to move, they'll be moving over the next few weeks. Andrew Woodcock, political editor at the Press Association, thank you very much indeed for your time and your wisdom. That was Andrew Woodcock earlier talking about the Brexit imbroglio. Tell me where you stand on it. 0344 499 1000. You call us, we ring you back put you on the radio, needn't cost you more than a penny or two. Or you can email me through the website at talkradio.co.uk. You can text, text the word talk, followed by your message to 8722, though that will cost you 25 pence plus normal charges. You can tweet me for free at George Galloway at Talk Radio. Lots coming in uh, by way of electronic paperwork. Uh, here's one, uh, an anonymous texter. I think I recognise the number. The reason the young loathe Brexit gets like you is because you are old fart, xenophobic dinosaurs still fighting the war, doing your Basil faulty act. And then he goes into capitals, remember Joe Cox. And the communicipalist says, I'm surprised today by how little comment in the mainstream media or on Twitter about France withdrawing its ambassador from Italy and threatening to break off diplomatic relations with an EU member state. This is the most extraordinary event in the history of the EU. Well, I talked about it, my dear friend, uh, and I wrote about it this week uh, in my column. Uh, online. You can find it easily enough. Uh, And I have broadcast to America twice, three times in the last seven days about it. But nobody's asked me 
here in Britain. In fact, it never happened so far as the British media is concerned. And Christina says, I think we need George Galloway as leader of the Labour Party. Gigi would not tolerate the behaviour of Labour coup MPs. Corbyn is good, but he's too easygoing on the coup MPs. Thank you, Christina. But uh, Labour already has a, le a leader and I'm not even a member. But thanks. Uh, Martin says, if we leave the EU, thousands of British children will be at risk from scurvy and rickets due to the lack of vitamins and fresh fruit coming in from Europe. The only way to avoid this is to have a people's vote and remain in the EU. That's from Martin in London, uh, hitting new heights in Project Fear. Actually, last I read, there's plenty of scurvy and rickets already back in Britain, and we're still members of the EU. President Paul Booker, brackets, self-appointed, says, so Vince Cable has said that he and 26 Labour and Tory MPs are set to revolt. I would suggest that many people think that they have been revolting for years. And Widooks says the liberal view of the problems with the EU is that outside forces, populists, Russia, Trump, etc., are coming in and ruining the party. A socialist analysis would start looking at the problems which are imminent in the EU. It's tearing itself apart. Well, I must say that uh, NATO and the EU are now uh, subject to extraordinary internal fissures. Turkey is in open revolt inside NATO against uh, the United States uh, on Syria, on Venezuela, on Iran, uh, on Saudi Arabia, uh, on the Yemen war. Turkey is really at daggers drawn now with its fellow uh, NATO members. Italy is at daggers drawn with the EU over immigration, over budgetary issues, over the pension age in Italy, as if that was any of the business of the bureaucrats in Brussels over the job creation uh, policies that the coalition government there has. There are daggers drawn over Venezuela. Italy is the only EU member uh, to robustly contest the prevailing narrative. By the way, whatever happened to all these um, high moral ground standing against Donald Trump in Europe? All these European governments are merely asking how high when Donald Trump asks them to jump on the question of Venezuela. Uh, but Italy is also at daggers drawn with the EU, which is allowing Macron to shower euros down the Champs-Élysées in absolute defiance of the fiscal rules, which were used to crush Greece, used, uh, threatened to crush Italy, would be used to crush Corbyn, were he to wish to run a deficit to get Britain's economy back on its feet. Uh, but they're allowing Macron to spend, spend, spend to try and buy off the rising tide of opposition in his own country. And uh, Di Maio, the deputy prime minister of Italy and the leader of the Five Star Movement, has uh, denounced the French state's treatment of demonstrators on its own streets and pointed up the total, utter hypocrisy of the line of the French and its allied governments that bludgeoning demonstrators in Paris is good, bludgeoning demonstrators in Venezuela requires foreign-imposed regime change. I'm, I'm, to call it hypocrisy, I mean, really, the English language is not strong enough to describe that kind of double standards. So, uh, going back to the texter, President Paul uh, Booker, I think it was. No, it was, uh, it was Widox. Uh, the EU is falling apart. The fissures within it, caused by adherence to a single currency, which, thank God, we avoid, which was imposed upon economies of such widely divergent strength and character that it has beggared half of Europe and enriched the other half of Europe. An EU which is effectively becoming incrementally an undemocratic United States of Europe, 
where none of the leaders are elected, none of them can be removed, but which more and more looks and feels like a single state. This is causing problems at the periphery, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, in Hungary, in Poland, and many other places too. It's a remarkable state of affairs, and we haven't even left yet. David Leviscont says the Labour Party needs to grow a pair and boot these people out who are poisoned and destroying the party from within. And uh, Scouser Lar says Tom Watson has threatened Wavertree CLP with a suspicion for tabling, with suspension, I beg your pardon, for tabling a no confidence motion in Luciana Berger. Since when did Labour become a dictatorship under Watson's control? Berger is an awful local MP and Watson needs to go too. Well, if you disagree with that, if you think she's a good local MP, let me know. 0344 499 1000. We are. Uh, I can tell you, uh, talking to Vince Cable uh, at uh, in the final hour, and uh, I'm uh, very much hoping to speak to Nigel Farage about his new Brexit party. Come on, Nigel. Anyone who can reach Nigel, uh, we all want to hear about that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll all join it. We need to hear more about it. Ryan says, Tom Watson branding the entire Wavertree CLP as bullies, demanding their no-confidence motion be overturned. This has gone beyond the pale. And Norman says, not a good look for the deputy leader of a democratic socialist party, calling for the suspension of a branch of that party in the most socialist city in the country for using that party's democratic procedures. Well, let's hear from the Northwest, from Manchester, Richard. Good Go ahead, George. Richard. Welcome. Uh, how are you? OK? Yes, by the grace of God, I'm good. Yes. Oh, great news. I hope Nigel comes on tonight. I've already had four calls about this new party. We knew it was going to be formed, but I've lost a little bit of time this week. I didn't know it was today. Yeah, so well, it's, re- uh, it's, uh, it's been accepted today by the Electoral Commission, so it is now a legal, extant British political party. And uh, depending on how things go with Brexit, it could do really well. Absolutely wonderful. I wrote to him and said there's 17.4 million people waiting to give you a few quid. If we all gave a, t- a tenner apiece, that'd kick it all off, wouldn't it? Well, that'd be the richest political party in history. <laughs> I, I, I believe me, I'd have a vision about it. And when you think about Blair with Andrew Neil saying, oh, yes, I'm going to stop it. I will stop it as much as I can. And then you get Lord Adonis, that great man, saying things like, yes, we, we, we have taken the Soros money to keep our things going. And I'm only telling you things that I've seen on the radio. And I'm uh, sorry, I've seen on, on TV and the radio and that I've been picking up. It needs a strong party now. And if this could get going, do you think that uh, Farage could, could lead us to a new party? Well, look, I'll, t- I'll tell you what I, I have said from the beginning uh, in writing and on air, uh, that it was a, a real tragedy uh, that when we voted for Brexit, uh, the only people that were there in Parliament to lead it were clowns, uh, circus clowns, yes. uh, people that you, you wouldn't buy a second-hand car from and you wouldn't leave your wife or your daughters alone <laughs> in a room with. Uh, it was uh, a great pity uh, that there was nobody, neither no. Farage nor myself nor no. many others, who were ready to... Give some vision, the vision thing, about George. what post-Brexit Britain could be like George, if we it voted been for it. Fantastic to have you on and to have Farage uh, on and and these other people. So get joining it. Let's have this new party. Well, get we need to hear more about it. We can't uh, we can't join it sight unseen. That's why we need <laughs> Nigel to ring up. Come on, oh, Nigel. He'll be there. He'll be there, George. Good luck and thank, thank you. you. For lead, thank you for leading us through it, George. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Um, now, let me get some more of the paperwork. Uh, President Booker, Widox, uh, David, we've got that one, Scousala, Ryan, Norman, Christina. Yeah, uh, the coup MPs did try to break Corbyn as a man. When Corbyn stands up in Parliament as leader, they never support him. They give him the cold shoulder. They stopped promoting Labour and have spent years personally attacking him and his supporters. That's bullying. 
And Hassan says, uh, we'll take an exit off the Brexit roundabout. My fear is that the whole exercise will amount to naught. Well, if it did amount to naught, then I can assure you uh, Farage will go through the political system like a knife through butter. Uh, Hassan goes on, though I was nominally against Brexit earlier, I could see the point of getting out, especially after how the EU treated Catalonia last year. Scouser Lars says Berger is an MP who only ever saw Wavertree as a safe seat for a career and had no connection to Wavertree. She also doesn't want a Jeremy Corbyn government when nearly the whole of Liverpool needs one. Good riddance to these Tory Tribute Act MPs. And Tony X, the wisest of my co-professors on here, says Andrew Woodcock is absolutely right. I find myself much closer to Rhys Mogg's position than to the government or Labour position on Brexit, something which is terribly uncomfortable to be close to a Tory position. But it's true. And Bob Justice says media Corbyn bashing is a ludicrous national pastime. I find his response to this abuse wanting, but that's not the bigger problem. This behaviour is aimed at millions of people too. Does the media understand this is a betrayal towards its own audience? Well, I suspect they don't. Uh, if you look at uh, Question Time uh, for a start, uh, it has so lost, so now utterly bereft of any credibility that I'm about to start my own Question Time. And... It'll be coming on your screens over the summer. How about that then? Here's a new caller. It's from Dallas in the United States. It's Albert. Albert, very welcome indeed. So far away. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. I, I admire you greatly. And I'm thank you. Um, happy to be on your uh, on your um, talk show. Uh, I, I, I'll try and be quick because last week we had somebody uh, who was uh, from the Netherlands, I think he was an economics professor, who, who, who thought... He was, was a historian, yeah, he was a historian. Yeah. He's a big hero now in, uh, in the Netherlands. Well, actually, no, it wasn't him. It, it, ah. it was somebody else. But anyway, that he, he thought it was a good idea to tax Amazon. And, and I'm not an Amazon shareholder, but I do shop with Amazon. And, and I just wanted to make the point that, yes, they had, and it's a big number, $450 billion in sales over the past two years. But I don't think there are many people who can tell you how much profit they actually made on those sales. If you take the cash flow they got from their customers and all their expenditure, it comes to less than a penny. Well, that's so what they, they say when they put in their tax returns, definitely. No, 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 no. That's in the actual financial statements. Yeah, I, well, flow, I just don't, I don't believe that Amazon is making a penny on each of its uh, $400 billion worth of transactions. I don't believe that. Well, I, I'm talking about the cash flow. Um, I'm not talking about the accounting shenanigans, although they don't participate. They don't do that. But yeah. but I'm a chartered accountant and I'm an accounting professor, and I can tell you, they make 0.8 pennies. They made on the to last two years of uh, of sales. It's it's true. Mr. How come Bezos the owner? Owns, how, how come the owner then is the richest man in the world? Oh, well, that's easy to explain because. Um, a company like Apple trades at a price-to-earnings ratio of 14 and is valued at $800 billion. Um, Amazon trades at a multiple of 80 and comes to the same valuation. In other words, the investors are thinking, you know, wisely or unwisely, that Amazon is worth six times Apple. They don't have profits, and Apple is, generates $50 billion a year in free cash flow. So it's, it's, I won't call it the madness of the stock market, because everybody has told us for years that Amazon should never trade at these multiples. It's not worth that. And, and Mr. Bezos proved them wrong. But if... if um, well, it's Amazon definitely been worth it for him, Albert. As pardon? I said, it's definitely been worth it for him. He's the richest man on the, on the earth. Yeah, but what happened 20 years ago, 25 years ago, he started a company called Amazon to sell books online. Mm -hmm. And he built that business up to the point now where... Yeah, but all we're asking him is to pay a decent amount of the money that goes to him to tax, that's all. But he only gets $80,000, $87,000 a year in salary. He, he gets no other income from Amazon. Oh, so he's only rich on paper. He's only rich what do you mean he's only he rich owns, on paper? He owns the Washington Post. He owns 16% of Amazon. 
And the, the value that the market places on Amazon is what makes him rich. <clears throat> and he has built a business that the market has now said is worth $800 billion. You can't blame him for that. I'm not blaming him. He, I'm not, I, I have no avarice not. or envy towards people on their yeah. salaries. Uh, all I ask yeah. is that they pay their fair share in tax. And nobody believes that Amazon is paying their fair share in tax. No, no I, can, I, I can vouch for that. Now, I can tell you that Amazon, that Apple's very profitable and Google's very profitable, but Amazon's purpose is to, uh, to give their products or your products, whatever you want to sell, to the consumer at the lowest price possible. But the other point I want to make is that <clears throat> when a company pays taxes, it considers the taxes as just any other expense, like they do rental. They try and recover that expense through their selling price. So ultimately... Well, it's very... Have... Look, we're running out of time, uh, Albert. Um, I'm presuming you're not uh, Mr. Bezos's brother and that you're a well-wisher helping us through the thicket of uh, finance capitalism. I'm grateful to you for having done so from so far away as Dallas, Texas. What do you think of that? 0344 499 1000. Dr. Fath, URS, says the riots in France are news, he capitalises. I used to believe it was the job of our outlets to report news. For heaven's sake, George, what have we as a population become? And why are we tolerating this right-wing agenda of silence? Well, there'll never be silence here, Doctor. And Dr. Fath goes on, great show as always, is it everyone? Or am I the only socialist who seems to despise these red Tory Blairite MPs even more than Tories proper? At least the Tories, as misguided as they are, are open and honest about their allegiances. And Ray says, great show, George. Love and respect to Bob Marley. He stood by all of the oppressed people in the world. A legend on the stage and off it taken too soon. Amen to that. Let's hear from... Steve in Waltham Abbey. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, pleasure to talk to you, Mr Galloway. And you, sir. Did you, what, what I'm ringing up about, did you watch uh, this week last night after question time? I'd rather stick pins in my eyes. Well, 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 well what it was, uh, Gal, uh, Mr Galloway, was that what you're talking about, the uh, French... Uh, um, um, was it the uh, French guy leaving Italy, the French... Um, the French uh, ambassador being recalled yeah, uh, well, from on, Rome, yeah. Yeah, well, yesterday, on this week... Uh, um, that's, that's round about, about midnight. About that, that, that's yeah. prime time. Yeah, well, that was brought up for... when they uh, uh, There were the two pundits sitting on the sofa, was Mr Portillo and uh, um, oh, the bloke who wants the people's vote. Oh, the spin doctor. Campbell. Campbell sitting uh, on there. I, I knew there was a reason why I didn't watch it last night. Yeah, no, well, he, he, he just gets me enraged anyway. But the moment of the week was uh, uh, Mr. Paul uh, Tillo brought up exactly what you just said about uh -huh. unprecedent of what had happened in Europe. Yeah. Right. And then also there was another guy that come on about late uh, that saying about what it was good that Harry's changed the dynamics in with that quote that. Uh, um, the letter that he, uh, that Corbyn writ to uh, Mrs May yesterday. Yes. And how he sorted things. But all what his name was on about, Campbell, was on about the people's vote. And both uh, that other guy, which you, I can't remember his name, that you, you had known from, um, uh, for, who was talking for Mr Corbyn and Portillo, just shut. Shut, uh, shut, uh, uh, Alistair Campbell down. He just goes on and on about it. And the, yeah, it's a broken record. But uh, one of the greatest joys of my life, Steve, is yeah. that the people's vote is now as dead as that dodo in that glass case in the Natural History the Museum. Both, both the gentlemen on, on the sofa. Right, kept saying it, but he won't have it. But the BBC absolutely love Campbell, didn't they? Well, they do, yeah, except when he was defenestrating them back in the David Kelly days. You and you'll what, learn more about that when you see my film. Oh, Alistair oh, Campbell oh. got rid of their star reporter, uh, their, uh, their uh, secretary general, their uh, director general, and their chairman, single-handedly. Uh, and yet they still have him on every other day, if not every day, in Parliament, uh, on BBC, rather. It is extraordinary. But I'm telling you, Steve, there's more chance of me becoming 
the Prince of Wales than there is of Britain having a second referendum. It's dead well, as a dodo. You know what, made me, what made me even why well, to ring you again today, Not none of it, on all the main news channels, I, I've been knowing poorly with my back and that, no one has reported anything, George. I've been going through all of it, and not one of it's been reported about it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the mass media has become a conspiracy against knowledge for the British people. But the good news is, now you can find the truth. All you've got to do is click your mouse. Steve, thanks very much indeed for that in Waltham Abbey. Uh, if you've got a call with a point of view, 0344 499 1000, dial me now. Get your call in. Don't leave it until the last hour because... Every week now, a large number of people who wanted to come on didn't get on because they didn't call early enough. Peter in Glasgow says it was the humiliation of Greece that did it for the EU, snuffing out democracy. Indeed it was, Peter. John Miles says Galloway is right about the lack of media reports on the troubles in France. I've lost all respect for the BBC, Sky and the rest of the MSM. The British public deserve better. And Ryan says Peter Hitchens once said Blairism became the dominant political ideology on both sides of the Commons in 2002. It's clear to see the potential for a breakaway party of Subri Umuna et al., a Trojan horse for the pre pro EU liberals, but still pro austerity. Let's talk to Cam in Cheltenham. Go ahead, Cam. Hello, George. How are you? I'm good, sir. Good, good of you to call. Go ahead. Um, well, Tom and Jenny Corbyn. I'm a big fan of Jenny Corbyn. I voted for him in the 2016 leadership election, and I really like him. But I think he needs to resign as le leader of the Labour Party. Tell me. Nothing against, nothing against him. But 72% of the members of the party want to remain in the European Union. How do you know and, that? Uh, the polls were released last week. Uh, what poll? A, uh, poll of a poll of how many people? Uh, I can't honestly tell you. Well, this is the point, Cam. You see, you're talking through your hat. There's 600,000 members of the Labour Party. Nobody knows. What proportion of those want to remain in the European Union? You're swallowing the people's vote propaganda, my friend. Um, I'll be honest, I don't actually support people's vote. You know, I, well, I'd, ha, I'd love to, you're I'd love quoting, to remain. You're quoting a poll you can't remember, and you don't know the numbers or how many people were polled. Well, well, no, I, I can't. I can't be honest with you. All I'm saying is that 70... OK, I can't tell you 70%. But from people I've heard, especially the student vote, people around my age, majority of them want to remain in the European Union, and Jeremy Corbyn is a Brexiteer. He's far more of a Brexiteer than Theresa May is, who's posing as one. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just feel majority of the Labour, people, um, Labour members want a Brexiteer, um, uh, Remainer, sorry, as the leader of the Labour Party, and I should be respected. I don't believe it should be someone like a Chukka Romana or Blairite, absolutely not. I believe it should be someone to the left, someone like Emily Thornberry or Andy Burnham, who unfortunately is an MP anymore. He's the mayor of Manchester. Yeah. But I feel like we can't have a leftist leader and someone who wants to support the European Union. That's well, just how I feel. Well, uh, it's a perfectly legitimate feeling, of course, and uh, the options are there for Emily Thornberry or who was the other one you, you mentioned? Uh, and, uh, not, not Andy, of course, MP. because uh, yeah, he's the he's the rather fine uh, mayor of Greater Manchester. Uh, but uh, Emily Thornberry could, of course, challenge Jeremy Corbyn for the leadership of the Labour Party. I don't think she will, because the same Labour Party members you're praying in aid would overwhelmingly back Jeremy Corbyn over her. I'm perfectly sure of that. Uh, actually, uh, Cor Corbyn voted. Uh, to remain in the European Union, some something he did to my dismay. Uh, he campaigned hard for a Remain vote in the referendum whilst I was campaigning for the opposite, and that was to my dismay also. But what Labour uh, stood on in the last general election, just one year ago, 
uh, uh, or two years, uh, coming up to two years ago, was that they accepted the result of the referendum. Indeed, so did the Tories. So more than 80% of the voters, young, middle-aged and old, voted for the two parties that said they accepted the result of the 2016 I referendum. So I don't see how you can hold it against Corbyn for doing what he said he would do in the manifesto for the last general election. Well, you say 80% of the part of people in the afternoon election voted for a party that vote, that supports Brexit. And I, I believe, fair enough, you have a Brexit wrong with it, but the reasons people vote for Brexit have been proven to be untrue. We voted, the country voted to leave because we were told we would get a good deal out, we'd get a good deal with the EU, not just tumbling out no deal on WTO rules. Where was that? Where was all that on the ballot paper, Cam? On my ballot paper, I only said, do you want to leave or do you want to remain? Didn't say anything about it. Didn't exactly. say anything about a deal. It's far more complicated. Well, no, it it's, was a binary what, question. Is, Cam, it exactly. was a binary question. Yes, no. Do you want to remain? Leave. And 17.4 yeah. million people chose leave. I know. But the thing is, you say leave, do you want to leave the whole European Union but remain in the custom market? Do no, you want to leave? No, none of that was on the ballot paper. Exactly, none of it. That's the problem. It was yeah. remain or leave. Which exactly. part of those two words don't you understand? Remain or leave? 17.4 million voted to leave, and we must leave. And Corbyn and Labour and Theresa May and the Tories both ran in the last general election on the pledge that they accepted that result. Last word to you, Cam. Uh, well, I've always got a huge amount of respect for you and for what you from campaigning against the war in Iraq. But I just want to say, we agree to disagree. Um, but all I'll say is, we say we respect the referendum, but are we not going to respect what was promised during the referendum when no, we want no. to leave? We're respecting the decision of the referendum. Cam, it's been great talking to you, and I appreciate it very much, the spirit of your disagreement. Jim is in Greenock. Let's hear from him. <laughs> hello, hello, George. A very great pleasure to speak to you. And to you. Um, yeah, I, just listening to the show tonight here, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that uh, the great thing about listening to you is I probably agree with about 50% of what you say, but it's a very important 50%. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we are very, very badly served in this country by the uh, political talking heads that dominate the media. We really are. We, I, I, we've I never been worse. We've never no, been worse served. I, I know, because it wasn't like this in the 70s and the 80s. No. I mean, you, you've got the same two dozen, roughly two dozen journalists that appear on every single... Uh, well, the two journalists from The Mail, The Guardian and The Spectator and maybe one other people, I don't know. You could name them all anyway. You certainly could recognise their faces, that's for sure. Yeah. They appear on Question Time. They appear on the paper review. Uh, just about every political platform that there is, it's the same guys, you know. It <laughs> is, yeah. And, and, and you're not there, George. <laughs> no, I, I, actually, I'm never there. Uh, yeah, like but I, I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about that uh, because I've got plenty of platforms and more coming along soon. So, you know, uh, people can find me if they want me. Well, you do great whenever you're in Good Morning Britain or, or whatever. One I get on that. ITV is the only uh, mainstream media slot that I get uh, at all. Well, and I was on it this week on the Thatcher statue with well, Piers Morgan and Susanna Reid and old Jonathan Aitken. Remember him? I do indeed. But do you remember the, the that very famous interview on YouTube with you and uh, that woman Coburn on the, on the Politics Live show? Indeed I do. I How could I forget it? Well, we'll compare and contrast that to this um, this uh, darling of the BBC, this Jess Phillips, who regularly appears on there as a safe Corbyn critic. Yes. You know, just just watching her this week, um, laughing and joking and chumming around with 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 Corbyn. It's a woman loving. You know, it's just, she gets the easiest of interviews. Well, the and, worst interview. And, 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 I don't know if you saw it, Jim. Uh, the BBC is uh, consistently the worst, but. I saw an interview this week between John Snow of Channel 4 oh, News oh, and is. Chris oh. Williamson, MP. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it, I mean, I don't know how that could possibly I, pass Ofcom. I, I really I, don't know how it could possibly pass them. It was the most you? blatant, aggressive, uh, vile uh, aggression. Uh, it was the opposite of an interview. 
it was a, it was an assault yes. on Chris Williamson. Yep, 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 and and that from this guy Snow, who in the in the eighties and nineties was a champion yes. of, of 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 Palestinian rights yes. and, and 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 of so many causes. Maybe maybe he's headed to. for the House of Lords. Would you put any money on that? <laughs> You'd know more about that than I would. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't, but I, I would say that the narrative control, but the BBC and the Sky, it just. Working to undermine Corbyn gets more and more blatant. Every well, day. it is so blatant that uh, it makes a mockery of the idea that there's a that there's a state regulator yes, of yes. the broadcast media. There's but, only a state regulator when it comes to me. That's all. A, you're dead right. And there's a guy on the other show. I yeah, don't worry. I advertise him, Tory boy Pierce, and he started off his programme tonight by saying. Uh, will the Labour Party always be dogged by anti do 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 do? And if, you know, the, 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 there's not many pro Corbyn MPs around. But whenever there is a sort of pro Corbyn MP, they, they they only get they get halfway into answering yeah, a question before they they're get, screaming. They get monstered. Uh, look, going back to my GMB interview this week, talk about three. I mean, it was three against one. It, it literally was <laughs> Piers Morgan, Susanna Reid and Jonathan Aitken on one side and me on the other side. And uh, at one point, old Jonathan said to Piers, you're doing my job for me rather well. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, Piers is so uh, thick skinned, he didn't get the point. Uh, you must be used to, I suppose, those kind of odds. Um, well, uh, two, I'm, I'm ready two to one any time. Yeah. But three to one is, is three to one, especially if I'm getting interrupted every half a sentence. Indeed. It becomes a bit a bit much, I must say. I was grateful for the gig and I like Piers Morgan and Susanna yeah. and I like their show and I'm always ready to go on it. But, uh, the but they, they really shouldn't do three against one. It's no. it doesn't look good. But then but, but what can you do? The, the problem is we've seen this absolute decline in, in, in fairness, if you want to call it that word. Yes. And, what can, people can do nothing about it, apart from tweeting a complaint on Twitter or something. Yeah. There's, there's really well, no they should do that. They, they should complain to Ofcom on Twitter. They should complain, but increasingly they should go elsewhere. Uh, and that's the business that I'm in. Jim, it's been marvellous talking to you. I love uh, to hear the West of Scotland accent, the Greenock accent from Jim there in Inverclyde. Thank you very much indeed. Zodiac says staying uh, in a customs union solves almost all the issues regarding imports and exports to the UK, including the Northern Ireland border. Nobody need get rickets. <laughs> and Simon James says, according to the Squawk Box, talking about this new centrist party starting next week, can't see it. But getting rid of some of the malcontents would make a great Valentine's Day gift. Now, Simon, if that's really your picture in that avatar, as you said it is, because you're coming to my Manchester gig on the 6th of April in the dance house, me and Ken Livingstone, 6th of April in the dance house, Oxford Road in Manchester, and you were the first guy to buy a ticket, and you said, this picture is me. If you see me, come up and talk to me. I think they'd be scared to come up and talk to you, Simon. You make... Uh, the biggest muscle man, Charles Atlas, look like a six-stone weakling. But thanks for the tweet. Bob says, ha-ha, Owen Smith is making noises around Westminster. Let me guess. Is it, do you want a flake in some hundreds and thousands with that? I think Mr. Smith covered himself in raspberry sauce with that ice cream van stunt. People want an end to austerity, not ice cream. Well, um, Viagra man Smith, what did we used to we used to call him Wally, didn't we? Where's Wally? We used to run a Where's Wally every uh, week here on the Mother of All Talk Shows, but he's back. You thought he'd uh, gone to the ice cream paradise in the sky, but he's back and he's leaving. I wonder how Labour can possibly survive it. Calling Nigel Farage, leader of the Brexit Party. I'm interested. We're all interested. Call us, 0344 499 1000. Whatever your point of view on any of the issues that we're discussing tonight, or even as our caller, Albert, in Dallas, Texas, on issues we're not discussing tonight, because we can deal with all comers on all subjects. Now, I have been making the point that there's not much coverage in Britain 
unless you follow me, unless you read me, watch me, listen to me, on the extraordinary developments between France and Italy, which has seen France withdraw its uh, ambassador from Rome and the country's trading insults and attacks across the Alps. Let's talk to Angela Giuffrida, who is in Italy, is a journalist, uh, freelance with The Guardian and an editor, and she's been good enough to join us now. Angela, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Good evening, George. Nice to talk to you. It's uh, come to something when two uh, EU and NATO neighbours uh, are withdrawing their ambassadors, threatening escalation, trading insults. Tell us what lies behind. Um, well, well, indeed, it has um, come to something. But what, what we have in Italy is a populist coalition government made up of two parties that have different objectives for antagonising France and, in a broader sense, the EU. Um, take, for example, Matteo Salvini. He, he's the leader of the far-right league, one of the coalition parties, and also the interior minister. Um, now he, he now said today that, that he doesn't want to argue with France, he, he, and he's invited his, um, the French interior minister to come and sit down with him to resolve key issues. Now, one of the most important issues for him is the situation with migrants at the French um, and Italian border. Um, this has been going on for, for quite some time now, where, where France is it's essentially become a bottleneck area and France has been sending back um, migrants to Italy. And of course, you know, immigration is, is Matteo Salvini's key theme. Um, so that's what, what irks him. Um, whereas the Five Star Movement and the other party in government, um, in a way, um, you know, them kind of looking to, to form some kind of alliance, perhaps with, with the Yellow Vest, is on the one hand um, they're, they're looking to regain popularity because they've lost some of the popularity um, to, to, to the League Party, and in, in, in it's kind of two messages. One of the messages is going towards its Italian voters. And it's reminding them that they, they still have the same kind of um, antagonistic spirit, um, the anti-establishment spirit um, that they had when they first began. But it's also a message to similar European groups who they could perhaps um, form um, alliances with after the European elections. Now, both of these parties, even though they may have different objectives, um, both of them are, a, a kind of um, taunting France very much with a view um, of the European elections. Well, the French president is currently languishing at 17% in the opinion polls. Half the French people support the yellow vests. Half of the others mm -hmm. uh, don't approve of Macron. More than half of the others don't approve mm -hmm. of uh, Macron. Uh, Macron says Italy is interfering in his domestic affairs, but he's interfering in Venezuela's domestic affairs. It's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? <laughs> It is. It, it, it seems, yeah, it, it seems to have come kind of, you know, there were issues perhaps that where previously um, governments might have kind of thought, um, you know, behind closed doors um, that, that just seem to be able to come out to the fore a lot more easily, especially with social media. Um, it, it's easy to, to launch these attacks and, um, yeah, not really... Um, without really considering what, what kind of impact they, they would have on otherwise um, diplomatic relations. Now, Britain leaving the EU um, uh, coming uh, up very, very soon, just about 50 days, I think. Uh, many people in Britain mm -hmm. think we're leaving behind a European Union that is itself beginning to tear itself apart. Angela? Yes, yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I just coming from the UK and, and, and speaking to friends there, I, I probably, yeah, would say that many of the people who, who no doubt voted for Brexit are probably looking at countries like Italy and seeing this kind of stuff going on and, and may, perhaps thinking um, we'll be better off um, out of it. Um, but again, I, I think a lot, a lot will will depend. I, I think what you know, if, if there's anything positive that might be gleaned from from the the rowing between Italy and France, is it might actually bring um, some of the issues, you know, 
to the table that do need to be discussed. Um, and that is hamper, hampering um, integration and unity in Europe. And, and one of them is, is, the, is the immigration issue. Um, so we have a situation where Italy has um, taken in um, born the bulk of the burden of, of migrant arrivals in recent years. Quite so. Um, uh, uh, are people any... arriving, Angela, from wars that Italy didn't start? Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think I think what, you know, they're very much pressing on on a point, apart from, you know, one, one of the key reasons for, for the fractious relationship between Italy and France was the um, intervention in Libya in yeah. 2011. Exactly. Italy didn't want, and that obviously opened... And Italy warned, you know, by the way, before that happened, Italy warned that if you blow open the doors of Libya, uh, there's only one result, and that is uh, Africa heading for Europe. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And the countries that ignored Italy's warnings did blow open the doors and blow off a lot of people's heads yeah. too, uh, are uh, squabbling about taking a few thousand refugees whilst Italy yeah, is left exactly. holding the babies. Yes, and, and this is the issue, especially at the border, when you have France sending migrants back, and they have been doing so um, since 2011. And um, people, there were still migrants at that border who tried. There was a, a young migrant died yesterday of hypothermia just trying to cross into France. Um, and all of this really is down to the, to a dub, the Dublin re- regulation, you know, a, a, a rule that really constrains um, states like Italy. Now, Angela, just tell me this. Um, in the European elections next year, are the Five Star Movement standing their own raft of candidates or are they standing in, in unity with the Liga? In, in terms of in unity as a government? Yeah, or? I mean, no, I mean, is there a separate list standing for the European Parliament elections? Are they standing singly or uh, in, a, in a joint slate? Well, they have been putting the feelers out with with um, gr- similar European groups. Um, I think that there's a, there's a party that I think in, was it in, in um, Czechoslovakia and one in Poland. And Salvini, the coalition partner, has been doing a similar kind of thing with in terms of trying to forge a far right alliance. Um, I'm not so sure anything concrete has come to plan with either of those just yet. But there's definitely been um, both parties have been looking to form um, alliances. Very interesting. Angela, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Angela Jufrida, who is a freelance journalist for The Guardian and an editor covering uh, All Matters Italian. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Peter in Glasgow says, Watson is a trumpet. Um, yes, not he's not a tuba that he used to be. He's more a clarinet these days. Uh, Colin in Colchester says, uh, excellent show again. I think it would be useful to hear more of a European voice on the current state of Club Euro. Italy are not happy. And I've just been reading that Greece are wobbling again. So why don't you get some of your European contacts on the air to provide clarity? Yes, we'll try and do that, uh, Colin. Now, here's Charlie in Manchester. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Charlie. Hello, George. Hi, mate. Nice to speak to you. And you. Um, Just got a bit of an issue. Well, let's say a little. It's got a big one. The sort of fundamental stance to the EU. Yeah is that you wish to pull out because it's a neoliberal organisation. Mm-hmm. However, so is the UK. Mm-hmm. This is not exactly a socialist paradise. No, and no. It, really, it's a bit between the devil and the deep blue sea. If we pull out of the neoliberal EU, we're mm-hmm. just left purely with the neoliberal UK. So I can't really see how that's helping. Well, the difference is we can vote to change uh, Britain. Well, we yeah, can We yeah. can vote to have... Uh, a left-wing government led by Jeremy Corbyn, for example. Uh, but we can't vote to change uh, the neoliberalism of the EU. That's the key difference, Charlie. No, true, but it's it's actually a hell of a gamble if you think about it. I mean, if you look at the history of elections in Britain, say, since the war, mm-hmm. Labour only wins now and again. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And when we do that's because Labour was different then. Yeah, but when we do win, like, the last Labour government was basically a red Tory government. Yeah, quite. Um, so the next one won't be though. Well, this is the gamble, and and to some I'm not extent, sure why it's a gamble. Like why, Charlie, of... Charlie, why is it a gamble? We're living in uh, dire, dire circumstances now in the EU. 
So where's the gamble? Well, well, there's one, just moving on a little bit, there's one other uh, major advantage of being in the EU for, like I'm calling for Manchester, the provinces. Like, um, we're to- one of the reasons why so many people voted leave was because they don't like too much London, because we're totally dominated by London, and everything is done in the interest of London and the South East. And Brussels, to some extent, is a counterpoint to that. I mean, if you look at the examples of places like Liverpool or Hull, they've sort of objective one status as partly put them back on their feet. I say partly, but it's better the, the improvements they've had that than not having them. And, we, and those sort of cities wouldn't have had that if well, we hadn't uh, been in the uh, EU. W- with all respect to you, uh, Charlie, we can't refight the referendum. We had the referendum. The decision was made. So we are leaving. Uh, the question is, what what uh, use are we going to make of the fact that we are leaving? That's the only thing that matters now, surely. Well, yeah, I mean, in, if you respect democracy, you do have to accept the results of the referendum. But yeah. I won't go into all the arguments about that it was predicated on a lie. And people were... I, c- I say that after every election. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I say the other side were lying. But, I mean, that's uh, just the way things are. There was lies told on both sides of the referendum, Charlie. But again, we're past that now. Uh, and the only uh, thing that's still in play is the actual terms on which we leave. And then what use we make of having left once we've done so. I can see there being a big campaign to actually get back in once we've left. Well, you say that, but the Liberal Democrats are the only party campaigning uh, to stay yeah. in the EU, and they're, they're on less than 10%. Yeah. Uh, so there's no... And the Greens, who also campaign to stay in the EU, uh, are falling in the public opinion polls. Mm. They've fallen again uh, in several polls this week. So there's no real evidence uh, that a party like this new centre party, for example, which stands on a platform of more EU, please, uh, and more uh, more austerity, please, more foreign wars, please. There's no evidence that that kind of a party is going to fly at all. At least not I can see, Charlie. Well, it probably will. I mean, the electoral system's going to be against it, isn't it? And they're going to go the way the SDP did. Uh, yeah. Yeah, although they did a lot of damage before they were through. Well, they did. They did. History might repeat itself. Yeah. Charlie, it's been a pleasure disagreeing with you. Thanks very much for calling. If you disagree with me, your call is even more important. 0344 499 1000. That's the number to call. Uh, Bob says there's an authoritarian bent that comes with centrist ideology. It's evident in France. Also, also the EU rebuffed Italy's budget, yet centrist Macron is allowed to spend to try and save his failing career. Closer to home, we have Watson suggesting a CLP is suspended. And Hassan says, it sounds like your accountant, Albert, from Texas, is an Amazon employee. I was one of these as well at one point. (laughs) Now, Nigel would love to come on, he says, but he's on stage tonight. So let's book him for next week. Uh, Let's book him now for next week to talk about the Brexit party and uh, tell him to give me a ring privately, will you? Uh, Tony X says, what do you think about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? I'm pretty bowled over by her straightforwardness. Her comment on Corbyn in response to a Hasbara manager, notwithstanding. Uh, The notwithstanding is a bit more significant uh, for me, Tony, than you, but she's clearly a very talented young woman. Fra says Vince Cable is simply trying to make himself relevant again. Another new party and third way. I think I'd rather vote for Farago. At least you know what he stands for. Although that said, I won't be voting for a UKIP. Has been any time soon. Well, it is interesting, and if Nigel was able, if he wasn't on stage tonight, I would have made this point to him, that uh, um, UKIP without Nigel Farage is nothing. A Brexit party running on the platform that we've been betrayed on Brexit and led by Nigel Farage is likely to be a very powerful political vehicle indeed, particularly in the run-up to uh, European elections if we are forced to participate in them.
I might even run myself. Matt Howell says John Perkins describes his work in South America promising infrastructure projects by selling loans to these oil-rich Middle East world economies that could never be paid back. A cheaper way of subverting and controlling a country than military intervention. Uh, Matt goes on, it's no coincidence that Venezuela sits upon the largest reserves of oil in that region. Duh. Actually, it's the largest reserves of oil on the planet. Matt says, keep plowing on, George. You're an oasis of truth and sanity in the swamp of the UK mass media. Matt from Tunbridge Wells. That's such a good last sentence, Matt. If you don't mind, I'm going to nick it for my own publicity. Mal in Belfast says, sorry if this is controversial. If Tusk says there's a special place in hell for all those who voted to leave the EU without a plan, and Sinn Féin and Irish nationalists in Northern Ireland agree with them, then where does that leave a United Ireland vote as a simple referendum? Ergo, they are now exactly the same thing. Irish nationalists, the EU and Ireland have seemingly painted themselves into a corner in those regards. If you want a United Ireland, then go get a plan before you can ever put it to the people. That's Mal in Belfast. Ryan says, I'm 22 years old. I'm a member of the Labour Party. I ever so marginally backed Remain in 2016. I have not been asked on my opinion for a people's vote. But if I was, I would say no to it. William Martin has tweeted, You are in no position to criticise other interviewers. If you want to hear a personal attack masquerading as an interview, I refer you to your, quote, interview, unquote, with Tommy Robinson. Within minutes, you were yelling at him, quote, ya ignorant wee nyaf, unquote. You say that, William, as if it's a bad thing. Let's hear from Carl in Southend-on-Sea. Go ahead, Carl. Hello. Hi. Hello, George. Thank you for having me on. I, 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 that made me laugh because, absolutely, I totally agree with you. And, you know, we, we need less, less of the Tommies and more of tolerance and understanding mm -hmm. there we are yeah <laughs> a, a veritas is the uh is the defense in that latter case i must well, say well yes <laughs> <laughs> tell but, me carl what do you want to talk about okay now this so-called brexit party that is going to uh be formed well nigel to... nigel's party yeah it's now been formed actually it's no it has been formed oh my goodness. it's now been formed it registered today successfully oh. with the electoral commission the centre well, party, uh, the Vince Cable, will hear from Vince himself at half past nine uh, how that's going. Well, that, that'll be fascinating because I'd love to see how he's able to be a member of two different political parties mm. and uh, political parties that have completely divergent views, given that, of course, the, the Lib Dems were responsible for the introduction of you know, student fees. Yes, uh, they don't like to, to talk about that. They, that, that that'll be an albatross around their neck, I think, Absolutely. for a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the reality is, and this is the thing, that we've seen splits like this before. And what we've seen are um, basically parties that have disappeared. Let's think about the SDP. The wonderful SDP who um, had uh, a, a, a good gun. They had a good gun, let's face it. They, they got a lot of publicity. And uh, in the end, I think only two or three of the Labour MPs who left and joined the SDP were re elected at the end uh, for only one term. Uh, I don't think it was three, uh, it wasn't but it, even three. Uh, I think it was well, fewer, fewer than three. Fewer um, than three. I'm well, just thinking now Shirley Williams uh, got in uh, in Warrington, didn't she? Did. she? Uh, Roy Jenkins got in in, in yeah. what was then Glasgow Hillhead. I defeated yeah, him right. in yeah, in 1987. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm struggling to think of uh, any more. David Owen didn't get in. No, William didn't. Rogers I, I didn't think, get I, I in. Had odd feeling there was one other, but I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, mm -hmm. and I hope I am to be honest, because all that this, all that's going to happen is that these uh, individuals who who have no interest in Brexit. Oh, what a pity. We've lost Carl. Are you still there, Carl? We'll get back to him because I was interested in that. Lizzie says, ha ha, Cam from Cheltenham. He's having a laugh, isn't he? I wondered if that was a wee wind-up, actually. Uh, w says, Bob Marley's dad was a Scot. 
as was Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings, the former President of Ghana, of whom his most memorable sayings was, My poor people, as he saw the donated agricultural machinery rusting in the fields and the artesian wells falling into disuse. Back to basics yet again. Here's Carl back on the line. I think, I think yeah, go to... ahead, Carl. No, but I was going to say that the, the individuals who, who want to um, leave the Labour Party, for example, and also leave the Conservative Party, um, are people who don't really have Brexit at the heart of their um, thinking. What they are concerned about is that uh, someone like Jeremy Corbyn, for example, who um, is a socialist and who has um, produced... Uh, policies and views, and especially this letter that's recently been written by him, um, that are able to do two things, which is to link the um, aspirations and the referendum wishes of of the majority of people, but also to provide a plan which makes um, the uh, future of our country much, much more secure, and especially for workers. Um, They have no interest in that. They want to attack this kind of socialism that uh, Corbyn represents. And I'm curious to know why. Why do they want to do that? They're using ev- they've used every sort of um, uh, uh, technique to do this. Um, the other day, I noticed someone, some uh, blue tick person on Twitter, who will remain nameless, uh, was, uh, I dare say Francis Wheatman, yes, I did say that, who said that Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn, was not holding his pen in the right way, and that that was some sort of criticism of him. Now, these sorts of people um, have certain views and certain attitudes which demonstrate that they are not, they are not there for the working people. They're not there for people who... Well, so, uh, some of them, uh, Carl, some of them, uh, I mean, let me, let's take a someone like Tom Watson. Uh, Tom Watson uh, would uh, quite like more Labour policies, I think. Uh, He's uh, a former union man, working class guy. Uh, He he would quite like a bit of extra expenditure on this, a bit of extra tax on that, a bit of extra public ownership on something else. Uh, what the problem for Tom Watson and for most of them, I think, is not Jeremy Corbyn's domestic policies, but his international, international world policy. view. I, uh, I, th- I think I, that they I could know, live I, they could live with a bit more socialism in the Labour domestic platform, but they can't live with what Corbyn represents on foreign policy. That's my view. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there are several things that can be raised about that. One of the things is, of course, the issue about Russia, which. Um, uh, we, we're, we're living in a time where um, it's a very strange time where the, the what, who's meant to be the most powerful person in the world, uh, Donald Trump, uh, is in the um, you know the control and the and and owes a favour, shall we say, um, through his business interests to the Russian. He's got a peculiar way of showing it. A very, yeah, he has. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, the worst. If the Russians did invest in him, it was the worst investment <laughs> in history. Absolutely. No, I'm not going to mention anything as people on this show because I'm sure that it's, it's not quite time to do that. Yeah. But the other We're thing, not yet at the watershed. At the, exactly. But the other thing is that, that we have this sort of bizarre thing where um, that's happening where, where, where Trump seems to be, you know, he's, he's, he's very interested in his business interests. Um, but nationally, um, there are other things going on, and some of them, of course, are the, the weapons sales in this country. And, and America is involved in weapons sales and involved in the investment uh, of we- the weapons industry uh, in this country, of selling weapons to, to Saudi Arabia to destroy, effectively destroy communities and people and children and hospitals and schools in Yemen and further afield. Um, and also, one has to say, um, you know, the fact that the Palestinians, for example, the, um, uh, the, those who are suffering under such a terrible apartheid occupation are seeing uh, the reality of um, money yeah, and yeah, weapons. Yeah. And other, uh, 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 other, other views are available on that, Carl. Uh, I'm not really able to talk about that last point. 
uh, such as the state of freedom of speech and expression in this country. But thanks very much for a fascinating call. 0344 499 1000, that's the number to call. We'll call you back. Won't cost you more than a penny or two. Liam A. Ryan says... Rank-and-file members have every right to deselect MPs whose actions have been antithetical to the basic principles of democratic socialism. By the way, he adds, it looks like there may be a border poll here in the north of Ireland. Any thoughts, GG? Any thoughts, Liam? Is the Pope a Catholic? Art Newman says, did you ever get your answer as to why Angela Rayner had dinner with Lord Levy? Well, According to her, it was to discuss education. And he asks, also, are you headed up to the North East with Ken and the Outsiders? Well, I'm, I'm speaking with Ken on April 6 in the Dance House in Manchester. We are still looking at other venues, other events further. But I'm speaking in Glasgow before that. I'll get you the details of that before the end of the show. Not with Ken, uh, me and Mark Wadsworth. And John in Cheshire says last November in separate speeches, Macron and Merkel called for a real true EU army. In December, Merkel said during her Conrad Adenauer memorial speech, countries should get used to the idea of losing their sovereignty. Also in France, there have been major riots in regional cities, not just Paris. For example, Bordeaux and Lyon. Merkel and Macron's speeches and riots outside Paris were ignored by our TV news. That's an SMS from John. Now we've got a guest coming up, uh, John Bofiglio, uh, a Latin American correspondent, I think he's in the US, on Venezuela. We've got uh, Sir Vince Cable, uh, Dr. Sir Vince Cable, leader of the Liberal Democrats, coming up at 9.30. I think we're on a promise with Nigel Farage for next Friday night on the launch of his new Brexit party. Don't tell me you don't get every point of view on here. Peter, who's a new caller, is on the line. Let's hear from him. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, how are you doing there, George? How I'm you? good. Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm, I'm calling from Monmouthshire. OK, welcome. Yeah, um, would you agree that the WTO rules in terms of Brexit is now the only option left? I, don't, I doubt it. Uh, uh, my guess is that the EU will reach an 11th hour settlement for uh, some kind of deal, uh, not that far from Jeremy Corbyn's uh, deal. That's what I think will eventually prevail. Mm. Uh, but uh, if it doesn't, then WTO is the way to go, yes. Um, um, can I may I respectfully disagree with you? Based, Go ahead, um, of course. You don't even need um, to be respectful. Just good. disagree. Well, um, I, th I think polite debate is, is always a good way to go anyway. Yeah. But yeah, um, I've been reading the um, EU Withdrawal Act and also want to question on parliamentary time as well mm -hmm. and, also, and also the Cross-Border Trade Act. Mm -hmm. um, Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act basically... Um, you, know, you, know, the, you know, the Dominic Grieve Amendment. Um, thank you, Dominic Grieve. Um, says an act of parliament has to be passed for the withdrawal agreement to be ratified, and mm -hmm. um, which basically mean, you know, meaning primary legislation. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of customs arrangements, um, I, I, again, a couple of things there, which I'm uh, which I'm not sure they're actually able to table it in the House of Commons because of Section 18 of the Withdrawal Act, where it says um, that basically a Minister of the Crown may lay before each House of Parliament a statement in writing outlining the steps by taken by the government in negotiations of Article 50 to seek an agreement, um, to seek and to negotiate agreement as, as part of the framework for the UK future relationship within the EU for, for the United Kingdom to participate in a customs version with the EU. However, Part 2 goes on to say the statement under subsection 1 must be laid before both Houses of Parliament before the end of the 31st of October 2018. So, so would any um, customs union plans which would go forward um, has a deadline for that passed? And furthermore, the ERG amendment to the Taxation Cross-Border Trade Act 2018, in the case of customs union between the UK and the EU, um, Her Majesty may not make a declaration by the Council under Subsection 4 unless the arrangements have been approved by an Act of Parliament. What's your point, Carla? Um, the point which I'm making is parliamentary time. Um, um, I think the Customs Union is actually illegal. Customs Union's illegal? Yeah. 
unless well, look, because we don't have a constitution, Peter, mm. uh, everything can be made legal. Uh, and yeah. nobody oh, can I tell mean. Her Majesty what she may or may not do. Uh, that's the I mean, crucial it, it, fact it, it, for, I mean, for, even for you. Even though it's an act of parliament. Even though yeah, it's an act of yeah, parliament. Yeah, look, an act of parliament can be passed in a day. If a majority in the House is found for a form of words... Uh, that will take us past the deadline and into the negotiations. Not many people understand that actually mm. all of this is merely uh, one door opening, uh, one door closing, another one opening. We are mm. going to negotiate our ongoing relationship with the EU after we have left. That's the whole yeah. point of the backstop. Now, um, yeah, obviously, we've got I, enough, it, we're in enough lovely. trouble trying to get uh, through the door and get it closed behind us. And I'm saying to you, I believe that we will reach a form of words which will command a majority in the House before uh, we leave. Now, I see Vardakar is saying now, tonight, that he doesn't think it will be done by the 29th of March. I've got no particular problem about a four-week delay, even an eight-week delay. But if it's delayed beyond the time of the uh, deadline for the European Parliament elections, uh, the Brexit party will sweep all before it and win the European elections. I'm predicting that to you now on the day that it was founded. And if it does, that will change the uh, whole dynamic of the European Union-British uh, negotiations into the future. So it's in the interests of the establishment to get this deal done and get it done quickly. Yeah, quite. But but even so, um, it it still has to be ratified, and and then and any extension to Article Fifty, or or um, I, I would say thanks thanks to Gina Miller case, would actually have to be um, ratified by an act of Parliament. It Am does. No, correct? you're right. There can, there can be no extension unless the government tables legislation to extend it. It can't be yes. done by Dominic Grieve or Chuka or Mona can't be done by any number of backbenchers. Yes, uh, in our system, only the government can table the legislation necessary to delay it. Yes, so if that's the case, and how long, obviously, given the fact that the, um, as, as you all know, the legislative process is quite a long one. Um, how, no, it doesn't have to be a long one. That's the point I'm making to you, Peter. Hmm. The Dangerous okay. Dogs Act went through the House of Commons in, I think, three days. As Steve Norris, the minister responsible uh, uh, for it, put it to me many times. It was absolutely barking. Peter, thanks for your call. I need to go because my caller is on the line from Mexico. He's John Bonfiglio. He's in Latin America and he's writing uh, as a journalist about what's happening in Venezuela. John, thanks very much for coming on the show. No problem. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and the better for hearing from you. I uh, apologise for difficulties in, in getting our call to you through. I know you're paying no for this call. I'm sure we'll reimburse it, but let's <laughs> press on. Now, um, John, uh, ever since uh, Donald Trump uh, recognised some guy in the street in Caracas as the president uh, of, uh, of Venezuela, a number of countries have followed suit, but far more countries, three times as many, uh, recognized Nicolas Maduro as the president of Venezuela. Uh, we're now in a kind of stalemate. What's going to break that stalemate? Um, essentially, there's two different, um, I guess, desires on both sides of the of the coin. On the one hand, Guaido, who, as you um, correctly say, absolutely is supported by the US and their allies, are trying to push this crisis to a head and want something to take place. On the other hand, Maduro, Maduro's regime um, and the status quo in Venezuela is interested in getting through each day and continuing without major incidents in inverted commas um, so that this impasse can, can extend and they can cement their, their position. It's difficult to know exactly what will take place. Um, over the ensuing days. I mean, essentially, if there is a flashpoint of some kind, which could be with USAID at the border, it could be in terms of maybe Maduro feeling that he has to uh, send people into arrest, Guaido, or something like that, then I suspect that there will be uh, a rapid unraveling of the situation um, and some sort of chaos unleashed. It's difficult to know quite what will, what will take place then. Alternatively, 
as I've said before, the status quo uh, continues um, and moves forward day to day. Important to say that the status quo is really not any kind of um, uh, achievable normalcy for any average citizen in, in Venezuela. I mean, you know, like it or not, we're talking about 90% of people in Venezuela living currently in extreme poverty, Venezuela having lost something like 15% of its standing population over the course of the last 18 months, etc. So somewhere down the line, something somewhere has to give. Uh, what, let's speculate then. Uh, let's start at the most extreme end, uh, because we are dealing with Elliot Abrams. Um, could there be an American military uh, invasion of Venezuela? Okay, so at the most extreme end, I think there could be some kind of um, military conflict, which could be a direct in intervention, or more likely it would be a proxy intervention. Um, the U.S. is massively helped at the moment by the fact that it has hawkish allies um, all around Venezuela, in particular Ivan Duque, the recently um, elected president of, of Colombia, and obviously, you know, the most obvious example of this is Bolsonaro in in Brazil. So yes, he's battling pneumonia. Good. I understand. He is. Yeah, he's, he, I think he's, he's going to be battling a lot of things over the course of the next few months. Maybe pneumonia is his lightest battle. Um, well, today. you never know. Maybe pneumonia yeah, might win. It might. Um, so there could be a, there could be some kind of intervention. I, I don't think we're going to be seeing American troops on the streets of Caracas. I just don't see a situation in which that can can happen or will be allowed to happen because, I mean, just to take it in a, in, in a really simple way, I mean, the only thing really that could have um, increased Maduro support in the recent past was some kind of American intervention, and that's kind of exactly what's, what's happened. So I think the U.S. know or really should know that any direct intervention um, uh, or even intervention by a third party is going to um, is going to be counterproductive. So yes, that is absolutely a possibility. I think there's um, there's an obvious other thing which could take place, which is um, what maintains the status quo more than anything else, which is that the military changes sides. I mean, the fundamental fact on the ground is that Maduro is still in power because he still has the military on his side. There's been some noises and the odd defection, both internationally um, and locally, some high profile military who've, who flipped, but to um, at the moment, it's the odd individual here and there. It's definitely not uh, a groundswell of, um, of support that's changed sides. So if the, if, the, if the military switch, then absolutely that's going to change things on the ground very, very quickly. That doesn't necessarily equate to Guaido achieving power or new elections. It could quite easily be somebody replacing Maduro from the... Uh, from the regime which currently exists, uh, the blame essentially being put on Maduro as an individual, and then kind of a sort of an appointment from from within, if you like. And then obviously the third thing which can which can happen is that the status quo uh, continues. That uh, Venezuela quietly and not so quietly moves on uh, in towards being a failed state of of, sorts. and we continue to hear statistics coming out of the country about the 1.2 million percent. Uh, Inflation rates, prices of commodities going up X amount of percent, um, etc. No medicines coming into the country, people selling their hair at the border, etc. And that plays on into the next few days, weeks and months and, and so on. Now, there was an opinion poll. Uh, I know it seems a bit odd talking about opinion polls in as uh, turbulent a place as Venezuela right now. Showed that uh, the Chavistas still had 33% support in the country. Uh, Guaido uh, and his opposition had the support of 18%. That leaves a lot of people in the middle, doesn't it? It leaves a lot of people unhappy with both sides of the equation. Um, absolutely. The Chavista thing, I think, is, is an interesting... Um, let's, let's assume for a minute that this is actually an accurate opinion poll and that it is um, you know, independently taken, etc. Um, the reason you would say that the Chavistas still have a relatively um, high support rate is because... In recent memory, in the 2000s, essentially, um, Chavez did transform Venezuela in large part, and um, 
Uh, although violence increased, GDP doubled, extreme poverty reduced from 22% to 8%, unemployment halved and the like. And that's only really 10 years ago. So people are still very aware that for the first time in their lifetimes, really, that there was a president who actually made things better for them. Obviously, that's gone massively south since, but there is still a lot of support, maybe not for Maduro, but for the Chavista project uh, on the whole. Very interesting. John, uh, it's uh, especially uh, good of you to call in to us at your own expense. I'll make sure that we reimburse the cost of the call. Uh, The line wasn't great, but the interview was. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. That's John Bofiglio, who's uh, on the phone from Mexico, but writing about the whole region. John in Cheshire says, last November in separate speeches, Macron and Merkel... Uh, called for a real, true EU army. I've already read that. Laura Jane Stoddart says, George, it seems you are forbidden from talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Please tell us what's going on. Freedom of expression is vital for shows like yours. Well, um, first of all, I speak about it all the time elsewhere. Uh, So if you really want to hear my views on that conflict, you're not short of places that you can go Uh, to do so. Um, I think you know the pressure I'm under, we're under. Uh, I think you know the difficulties. Uh, The decision is mine, not talk radios, uh, that as long as the pressure we're under uh, continues, uh, that I will not speak about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And the reason for that, you might actually know in public, in the public arena, very, very soon. Uh, Mal says, this food scare propaganda with prices going to soar if we don't get a deal annoys me. We come from a green and pasture land. Make no mistake, we will always have seasonal local food to eat. We will not starve. If imports of food are more expensive, then we will learn to eat the internal market because of probable surplus and adjust our diets. It could end up with that local food will be cheaper if we cannot export. Now, one last before the break. Terry Eaton says people today have to search out the facts for themselves. The EU has been tearing itself apart for years, but we don't hear it. When we leave, others will follow. And that is why the power mongers don't give us the full info into all the infighting. Zodiac says the gamble is that we lose the constraints that the EU puts on right-wing UK governments regarding environmental and social protections, as well as regulations on manufactured goods, which luckily the EU brought in. I'm just not with you on that, Zodiac. The idea that we need Donald Tusk to civilise us is really not an idea I can buy into. Imran is in Birmingham. Go ahead, Imran. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are we doing? You all right? Yes, great. Thank you. What would you like to say? Yeah, George, just uh, firstly, I want to start off by saying, um, you know, I'm a big fan of yours uh, since you, well, since you uh, entered the public uh, public eye. Thank you, Emma. Of course, all, all, all the work that you've obviously done uh, for, for various different causes. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, great advocate. For, you know, uh, it's 20 life. years ago this week that I took a red London bus, not this week, this year, a red London right. bus all the way from Big Ben to Baghdad. It's what, I was just thinking about it today. It's one of the best things I've done. Oh, fair play, fair play. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. As I say, I mean, uh, big, 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 big admirer, and uh, yeah, just keep up the good work. Thank yeah. you. Thank Looking you. forward also to uh, to this uh, new Question Time uh, uh, show. That, yes, be, uh, yes. Uh, more more information follows. Yeah, because no, I totally agree with you. I think that um, the, the 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 existing version of of uh, what is Question Time is uh, it's utterly bankrupt, isn't it? Not, yeah, yeah, it, it is, and and you know, I, I don't know if you're a fan of Medi Medi Hassan at all, but um, I mean, some 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 of what he does uh, speak about is is a lot of sense. But uh, every time he's been on there, and I don't think they've had him on for a while, they've they've always shut him down for whatever particular reason. But yeah, uh, yeah. anyway, that's by the by. Um, yeah, what I want to really bring up again was uh, what you what you brought uh, up at the very uh, 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 top of the show regards to. Uh, Europe and the European leaders being in the in the pockets of uh, uh, Donald Trump, and um, tying that in with uh, and I am I don't know a whole lot of, of, of politics and you'd be surprised to hear that and why I'm probably listening to your show, but uh, 
I, I am I am more inter- interested in 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 you know conspiracies and all that kind of stuff and people you know people's backs start to 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 get to get up at that word but uh, they need to have a good look at what conspiracy means and not get get it mixed up with the commonly f- uh, used phrase of conspiracy theorists which is uh, 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 something completely different and uh, a, a word that's been made a mockery of uh, and, and 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 therefore a lot of people don't take note of of, of uh, conspiracy yeah. playing inside. Well, uh, I mean, you? there are lots of conspiracies in the, in history, uh, and you know, there's lots of conspiracies taking place today. Not everything yeah. is a conspiracy, uh, and just because not everything is, doesn't mean that nothing is, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. but the point I was going to make was, uh, you probably saw this video, um, which is a well documented video and easily e- easily uh, found on 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 uh, YouTube, for example. Uh, of uh, George Bush Sr. when he uh, famously uh, uh, stated that uh, there would be eventually a one-world government and it would be the, the new world order, as they, 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 they uh, quite nicely put it. And, um, yeah, and I just seemed, uh, I just seemed to, to see it unfolding. Uh, I don't know if you agree, but... I, 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 I don't do. really, know. I think the uh, existing state structures and supranational structures like the EU are in such a state uh, that the idea yeah. that anybody could govern the entire world is uh, is definitely fanciful. Uh, I don't see China... What about, what about I don't see China ever agreeing to be governed by the United States, do you? Yeah, well, no, that, that that's right. There's always going to be a select few superpowers, isn't there? You know, play, uh, uh, playing, playing. Yeah, I think we, we've got far more uh, equilibrium in international affairs now, despite the chaos, than we did yeah. at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia yeah. is a power. China is a power. The BRICS are a power. The EU uh, is a power of a sort. Uh, but I've been surprised, Imran, by how quickly all these European leaders that were laughing uh, behind their sleeve, at least, at Donald Trump, have fallen into line with his demands uh, on on Venezuela. Have you been? I was surprised at that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I agree with a lot of what the last caller said. I thought, I thought that was quite interesting, really. And um, it just goes to show, I mean, uh, there's, there's quite a, an interesting documentary about... Um, uh, economic, uh, economic uh, hitmen, economic hitmen. Yeah, that's a very great sent, book. Yeah, yeah, which is which are sent by you know the powers that be, you know the, the American government and whatnot, the CIA, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they they sort of blackmail these sort of smaller governments, if you like, these smaller powers into certain things, and then if they you know if they don't agree, then they 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 slowly yeah. you know. But, yeah, no, I I, I I agree, but you know France and Germany can hardly uh, be described as smaller powers. Imran, thank you uh, for that call. I have on the line Sir Vince Cable, Doctor Sir Vince Cable. Vince, thanks very much for joining us at this late thank hour. You, George, uh, thank you. Good to speak to you. And you, sir. Now the uh, the news is full of your uh, well, two things actually of uh, of um, Nigel Farage's new Brexit party and your new uh, centre party. Although from what I can read, it's not quite a party, more a coalition. Can you tell us more than you wrote in the Metro today on this? Uh, well, it, I didn't write it, but it, there was a report, yeah. which is broadly accurate, I think, that there are, there are very unhappy people in the Tory party with what's happened over Europe. And I think there is, uh, certainly on the basis of the conversations I've had and, and the things they've said publicly, that some of them are going to break away. And there are similar problems in the Labour Party, uh, particularly, I think, reinforcing what's happened today and... Jeremy Corbyn effectively throwing in his lot with Theresa May over Brexit. Uh, there may well be some who no longer see their future there. So I can't see any more than that. But I think there will be a group of people who will opt out um, over this issue under the general direction of politics. And I've said that, you know, my party is happy to work with them whether we call it a confederacy or a coalition, I, I have no worry about language. Take, I don't take, think take my advice and avoid the term confederacy. Yes, I realise it has historical <laughs> connotations that might not be totally right. Now, but. Vince, uh, you and I, being Dunsert and Ash, 
uh, have been he here before. Uh, indeed, we you were once in the before, Labour yeah. Party in Glasgow. Uh, and, uh, of course, we both lived through uh, the relatively short-lived uh, SDP breakaway independently from the Labour Party. Of course, they eventually merged with the Liberal Party. Um, I suppose the first question is, will, if you like, centrist politics do any better in the 21st century than they did in the 20th? Well, I think there's a big difference. Um, I think if it was just uh, what's called an SDP Mark II, I don't think it would be very successful, um, partly for the reason that the SDP Mark I ultimately wasn't uh, a success. Uh, it would just weaken the Labour Party at the expense and strengthen the Tories. So I think what is happening this time and what must happen this time is that it's got to be a combination of disaffected Tories and Labour people. Uh, otherwise, as I say, we repeat the same history um, and, and in a less satisfactory way, possibly. So that's the, that's the first point. Um, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're, the, the whole idea of centre isn't the right way of putting it. I mean, if you take the issue of Europe, um, you know, my party and the people who sympathise with us are way on the other side of, you know, the Brexit argument. I mean, there's a different, you know, as you would put it in your um, revolutionary days, a different dialectic is at work here, I think, um, rather than the old right and left and centre. But mm -hmm. We are needing some, um, you know, I think, a different kind of politics, and it, it's not repetition of SDP. Well, it might surprise you to know that I wish you well, because I, you. I think that the uh, the pattern of British politics, and indeed I pressed both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown to introduce proper proportional representation in Britain, precisely because uh, there are more than two ways in mm. uh, in British politics, the, the, and and in European countries, it's quite normal for there to be five, ten, fifteen parties uh, represented in Parliament. But our electoral system makes that uh, almost impossible to achieve, isn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there there is a, a role for a proper socialist party, and. Uh, there ought to be, but, you know, there are people of what you might call more social democratic liberal persuasion who are sort of squeezed out of the present system. Uh, I don't like, uh, you know, English nationalism of the kind we're now getting in the Tory party or UKIP, but they have a right to be heard. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's outrageous, really. That I think UKIP got 15% at the last election, didn't get any MPs. Um, and not, indeed, the the, the the SDP Liberal Alliance, though judged a failure, uh, yeah. were into the twenty percent, well, but not the, that was not yeah. being reflected well in 20. Parliament. Yeah, so we we do have more proportional voting in Scotland these days at both assembly level and uh, Parliament level, sorry, and on local government, and it it does work much better, I think. So. Um, if this happens, uh, are we still talking about if, or, or can you now say that you're certain it's going to happen? I think it's very likely. I mean, it's, it's, I think you know, you've been an MP and you you understand the the power of tribal loyalties and also, you know, the fact that some people have to be quite brave giving up their careers as, as they see it. And, you know, there's a salary and a job and a family and all those things. So for some of them, it is a big leap. And I can't be absolutely certain that, that, that they will do it. But I, I think all the vibes I'm getting are that something like this will take place in the next few months. Uh, that was my next question. Uh, we're talking months rather than weeks. Well, uh, it may, I, I would, I think months, because it, it would be logical if this happened after the Brexit process, but it, it could happen before. Mm. Now, um, you, uh, as I said, were both uncertain, Ash. Uh, would you make way uh, as leader for uh, for one of these uh, bright young things that would be coming in from either the Conservative or Labour side? Well, I've, I've made it clear that, I mean, I have some jobs to do. I mean, I want to see through, the, you know, the Brexit argument. Hopefully we'll get our people's vote at the end of it. We're still thinking for it. Uh, there's local elections which matter to me and my party. There may even be a general election. But, you know, assuming that all that is tidied up, I'm very happy to wait, wait for the next generation in, in a reasonably short order. Now, uh, uh, given that... Um um, there are a, a number of uh, of people who would be 
Papa Bile, as we say, who would be potential uh, leaders. Most of them on the Labour side, though, I would uh, have thought. Um, you're... I, think get, I think you're getting a bit ahead of yourself here. I think, you know, it is, uh, there are some very good people in my own, own party who would certainly fancy their chances. Yeah, yeah, of course. It forms to the party that I'm talking about. We may indeed be opening it up to outsiders, the leadership process. Yeah, I saw I'm that. I'm concentrating on that for the time. Well, being. that was to be my, my last question, and I'm grateful for your time. My last question is this. How does your membership feel about this? Mightn't there be a slight irritation amongst your rank and file that uh, quote-unquote star uh, names uh, will be coming over from other people and that that will somehow be an imposition on the Liberal Democrats? Well, I think we've got to be bigger than that, actually. Um, I am proposing some reforms at our spring conference uh, in uh, in March, uh, and it will open the party up. Um, uh, they've got an, I, I, I really don't think, given the state of crisis in the country at the moment, I think any party should be petty and inward-looking and narrow. I think we, we do have to look outward and work with people elsewhere in, in the political world if they share our values. And I'm sure you know you may not be in quite the same position yourself, but I think you'd agree with that, the, 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 the petty party um, tribal alignments are not what the country wants at the moment. Always a pleasure. Dr. Servins Cable, a leader of the Liberal Democrats, thanks for joining us. Charlie from Colross says, just to point out that the SNP are calling for another two referendums. That would make it a referenda, Charlie. And they are predicted to gain 15 seats. That's 50 stroke 59 in a general election. Thoughts, gorgeous? Um, I'm not sure who predicted that, uh, Charlie, uh, but Ahema Dutz. Uh, malfunctioning marionette says, What a surprise, Vince willing to split left leaning votes as well as jump into bed with the Tories in a coalition. It worked so well the last times both were undertaken. More years of the Tories and then forced austerity. Uh, Tony X says, As you might know, Irish reunification was my primary reason for voting leave. Take it where you find it. And I've been monitoring the fast-growing swell of Irexit supporters because, after all, one Ireland under the EU is no Ireland at all. Let's hear from Dana in Bromley. Dana, welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about um, Luciana Bergeron, what happened uh, tonight. Okay. Um, I watched the um, Al Jazeera documentary um, called Lobby. Yeah. Um, and since uh, Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party in 2015, um, he's faced lots of attacks from right wingers, supporters of Israel, um, obviously due to his long standing support of uh, Palestinian human rights. Um, Luciana Berger, she's the parliamentary chairperson of the Lewis, uh, Jewish Labour movement. Um, and they're a group which lobbies for Israel and they've got strong links with the Israeli embassy. Yeah, it's not, In, uh, it's not Dana, uh, a topic for tonight. And I've already explained uh, what the situation is. I do hope you'll forgive me. Damien, the legend, is in Brighton and he's up next. Go ahead, Damien. Good evening, George. Good evening. Um, George, um, could we discuss Tom Watson's latest attack on Labour members and CLPs? Uh, yes, I think we can, safely. OK. Um, now, I think um, the comments that uh, Mr Watson made raised some very important questions about the behaviour of Labour, Labour MPs um, and their political obligation to the Labour Party. Go on. Um, now, it might appear quite boring subject, political obligation, but actually it's the glue that holds political parties, countries and even international institutions together. Uh, and a political obligation is where um, an individual, if they live in a society and benefit from living in that society, have a political obligation to honour certain rules to get the benefits. Now, um, I won't go into too much detail because there is a whole big discussion on political obligation regarding the relationship between civilians and the state, uh, regarding consent, whether they're opting in and this kind of thing. So there's a grey area there, George. But when it comes to the political obligation of Labour MPs, they are crystal clear. 
Um, I would argue I can identify four immediately, George, which would be um, that you campaign for the return of a Labour government, that you vote with Labour on budgets, competence motions and manifesto policy commitments, um, you promote party policy and you endorse the party to be the next government of the UK and the leader of the party to be the next Prime Minister. Now, on that basis, George, I completely disagree with uh, Tom Watson's position on this because... Well, there's been, I mean, there's been a whole number of Labour MPs who have been asked on the media. Uh, in one case, in Chukamuna's case, on the eve of the local elections last, uh, if uh, he wanted Jeremy Corbyn to become the Prime Minister of Britain, if he wanted a Labour victory, and he and Berger and many other MPs, uh, uh, the fellow in Nottingham, for example, have all refused to do so. Uh, and I would suggest, George, that by doing that, they are in clear breach of the obligation, the political obligation to the party. Now, they joined the Labour Party voluntarily. They have explicitly agreed to those the outlines, uh, the obligations I've outlined, by standing as Labour candidates. And I think um, I think that if a CLP is burdened with an MP that will not promote the party, will not seek to return the Labour government and endorse the party um, and uh, the leader, then they are well within their rights to censure and deselect or trigger, should I say, trigger the reselection. Yeah, process. well, they, they, they certainly are well within their rights under the rules of the party. That's why Tom Watson's demarche today was uh, particularly obscure and obtuse. Uh, but wouldn't it have been better uh, if the Labour Party's rules required every member of Parliament, once in every Parliament, to have a vote of confidence, a reselection of themselves? Wouldn't that have avoided uh, the kind of uh, ugliness that we've seen today? I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm fully in favour of open selection, George. But, <clears throat> but if I may just stick to my point which is that if a CLP did not censure and deselect an MP who were not fulfilling their political obligations, that CLP would in fact be in breach of its own obligations to the party. So I think, uh, for me, George, um, this is the final straw with Tom Watson. Um, on top of everything else, um, the deputy leader of the party has insulted the membership once too often. We already had a resign Watson effectively have no confidence in him, which trended number one globally on Twitter. And I think it's time for Tom Watson, who stood on the prospectus of, of supporting the leader 100% and did nothing but plot against him and tried to undermine him for three years. I think it's time he stood aside so we can get a deputy leader who will support the leader instead of constantly undermining them. Thank you very much, Damien in Brighton. Here's another legend. You wait all night to come along at once. Here's Norma in Bristol. Hello, George. Hi, Norma. I am. Um, I'm phoning on behalf of women because there are not enough women that ring you, George. No, they're not. I, no. I, I do keep asking for it, but I, uh, I, I don't know why they why they don't. I thought no, when I, I, I took Dana, I thought I was about to hear a woman's I voice, did, but yeah, I uh, thought but that. Uh, not. Anyway, you are now. <laughs> holding the banner for the women tonight. Go ahead. Well, yeah, actually, I tore a muscle in my leg a couple of days ago, and it's really, really painful. But that's not very appropriate to tell you that. Well, struggle on, anyway. I am. <clears throat> Venezuela, George, I just yes. want to know. Um, obviously, the Venezuelans don't want all this interference from other countries, but I'm not happy that the food, etc., is not being allowed in because of the barriers on the Colombian-Venezuelan border. <coughs> and, um, George, the principles are OK because, you know, it's probably coming from the USA, but on this one, you can't let people starve. I think it's wrong. What do you think? Well, it isn't food. It's uh, weapons and uh, well, agents. It's food. Uh, it, no, it's... it's uh, if you think that President Donald Trump is sending food to Venezuela, you need to look mo look up more information, Norma. This is being organized by Elliot Abrams, who did exactly the same thing in several uh, Central American countries, including Nicaragua. Let's send in food aid. But in amongst that food aid is the very 
uh, subversion and armed, violent subversion that uh, is the uh, stock in trade uh, of these uh, people. So I'm sorry, I'm just not with you on it, Norma. That's twice in two weeks we've disagreed. I'm sorry about that, but I can't let your legendary status uh, mean I have to agree with you. I've got another important caller on the line. It's Doogie in Wolverhampton. On you go, Doogie. Are you in the country? Yes, I am tonight, George. Excellent. Thank you. Very clear line. Go yes. ahead. A serious question for you now, right? Yeah. You're never going to get back in the Labour Party. Never. Well, so thanks. would you be prepared <laughs> to stand in Nigel Farage's new party well, I, I, as an I, MEP? Yeah, well, I did uh, say that earlier on. I need to speak to him as to what the platform of that party is. If the party was purely about Brexit, and no other uh, far-right uh, accoutrements uh, if it was purely to uh, bring about the absolute implementation of the decision that we took in 2016, I'd have to consider that, yeah. So, Pat, because I don't even understand now why you even back Jeremy Corbyn, because the letter A route yesterday basically means that we don't leave the EU. It's Brexit in name only which is what the Labour Party are backing, and which the Labour Party are ignoring the 133-plus constituencies that voted to leave. So I don't understand how you can back Jeremy Corbyn. Well, uh, the Blairites that are about to jump ship uh, are saying the opposite. That's got nothing to do with Blairites, No, George. but what I'm saying is they're saying the opposite. They say that Jeremy Corbyn has just thrown his weight behind Brexit. Why do I stay in the customs union? Well, it's not the customs union, is it, Dougie? It's our customs union. They won't negotiate, George. You know that. I know that. And the millions and millions of Labour voters that voted to leave know that. Well, I've got no problem with our customs union, a customs union that doesn't uh, stop us negotiating our own trade deals with other people, a customs union that doesn't effectively keep us in the single market, a customs union that therefore in the single market requires us to continue to accept free movement of cheap labour uh, into the country. I'm, I'm not against a customs union like that. Nobody with any sense would be. Do you really believe that they'll give us that, George? No, I, I'm just making the point that our customs union is not, in principle, something that I'm against, and neither should you be. Yes, w I am. Well, I am, George. No, but what, whatever, back, even if it achieved the things I've just no, said, it would achieve. Going back to it, you know, a customs union, as you you say, will not that the EU will not negotiate on the customs union. Yeah, well, in that you're case, we wouldn't have one. Yeah. If you're right and I'm wrong, uh, then we wouldn't join it and I wouldn't support joining it. But I'm just saying to you, it is not in principle... Union, George. I'm saying it's not in principle a bad thing to have a customs union with our former partners in the EU as long as the red lines of British sovereignty are not, uh, are not crossed. Last word to you, Dougie, because we're running out of time. George, run with Nigel Farage and get us out the EU, out the customs union and out the single market. Good night. Good night to you, Dougie, uh, and thanks for that uh, rare moment of amity between us. Um, of course, uh, there will be no Brexit party running in the European Parliament elections unless we stay in the European Union longer uh, than the 29th of March. So if it's delayed, depending on how long it is delayed, uh, we uh, may not be participating in these European Parliament elections uh, at all. But if we end up doing so, I think Nigel Farage's Brexit party will sweep the boards uh, because it's not as if the other parties have a raft of really popular MEPs <laughs> on board at the top of their lists, most people don't even vote in the European Parliament elections. Sabrina says, love the show. I've been devastated about the coup in Venezuela. I lived there and can see through the propaganda. You said that there were a lot of woke people, but will one million people ref Iraq? Why are so few speaking out about Venezuela? Many thanks, Sabrina. I 
really don't know the answer to that, Sabrina. I am astounded at the number of Labour MPs utterly silent on the subject of Venezuela, especially those that used to adorn the platforms all over the country in support of Venezuela. It's peculiar. Well, it's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you, and if it was, I hope you can join me uh, next week at the same time. To all the callers who didn't get through and the messages I couldn't write a uh, uh, read out, my sincere apologies. Stay tuned. Flippin' Kath is up next. <laughs>